Hello. Oh, hi. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks very much for coming along. Uh, welcome to Cloud Foundry 101, an introduction for developers. Uh, so over the next half hour or so, we're going to go uh, and look what it's like to use Cloud Foundry, but from an application developer's perspective. So we're going to look at some main concepts and some commands to kind of help you get started uh, when you're first playing with uh, Cloud Foundry. We're also going to look at what type of applications you can deploy using Cloud Foundry, how you manage services and databases, and also we're going to have a look at logging and debugging. We're not going to go very much into great detail of like the internals and how the components work together with each other. Uh, we're just going to yeah stay up developers for the next half hour. So before we crack on, who are these two strange people who have come here to talk to you for half an hour? Uh, so my name is Maria. I work for Pivotal. Um, I, I'm a developer for Cloud Foundry, and I'm currently on the team that provides Redis as a service for the platform. Uh, and I'm Jatin. Uh, I work uh, for Pivotal as well. So I work on the team which is trying to solve the problem of backing up and restoring Cloud Foundry as a platform. All right. So what is Cloud Foundry, and like why why should you care? Um, in a nutshell, Cloud Foundry is a platform or a tool that takes your code and does whatever it needs to do to make it a running application somewhere on the cloud or somewhere in a server. There's a famous haiku that you might have heard of, which goes, here's my code, run it on the cloud. I don't know. I, I don't care how. And that's, that pretty much describes it quite well. Uh, it's obviously a, a lot more involved than that in the background. But as far as we are concerned, um, it solves a couple of very important problems that developers face uh, quite often. The first of them is that uh, it gives you complete flexibility on how elastic you want your application to be. So you can, you can have more instances of your application quite easily. You can have more memory or more disk on your server uh, if you see that your application needs it. And that's quite straightforward to do. A second point is that uh, it makes it really easy for a developer to have a complete replication of their environment. So a problem that I've had in the past is that I would be developing my code against a development environment, um, and then the, the production one would have a slightly different setup. And I would run into issues that had to do with the configuration, the setup of the environment, not so much with the code itself. Uh, so Cloud Foundry makes it really easy to just have exact re replication between your, your development and your staging environment, your CI, and your production or whatever else makes sense for you. Right. So how does the Cloud, Cloud Foundry ecosystem look like? So Cloud Foundry itself, as you might have heard, is an open source software. Uh, you as a developer uh, would never have to install Cloud Foundry. That should be done by uh, someone in your ops team in the, in the organization. Uh, you, like normally, there are different flavors of Cloud Foundry that people install. So you could potentially just download the release, open source releases, and the operator can install Cloud Foundry open source. People also go for a different flavor of Cloud Foundry made by like nearly all of these companies, uh, which essentially provide support and their add-ons on top of Cloud Foundry, on top of the open source Cloud Foundry. And that is deployed on-premise. So that is deployed on hardware, hardware that you own in your company. So the other option is to use Cloud Foundry as a service. So there are certain sites in which you can go to and sign up uh, for a Cloud Foundry account. And then you will you will receive credentials through which you can deploy applications on their environment. This is really useful if you are like just starting out and you don't have that many applications to push on Cloud Foundry, or you just want to try out Cloud Foundry. So the other the other scenario uh, is that how how can you use Cloud Foundry on your workstations, or if you if you would like to work with Cloud Foundry offline. So there is this tool uh, developed by PC, uh, Pivotal called PCF Dev. Which you can, uh, which you can essentially download and run on your local machine. So this will give you a condensed version of Cloud Foundry. So this is not Cloud Foundry as it runs on the server. So what what we have done is, uh, like, taken all the components and fit them on one virtual machine. They will give you, like, around the same uh, interface as your application would have when it runs in the cloud. So we are also going to be using. Uh, this tool uh, to, uh, to for our, all of our demos. Uh, it takes around 15 minutes to install. It's pretty easy. Uh, so now, so now it, it now 
uh, we come to the next part of our talk, which is like uh, how a day looks like in life of a Cloud Foundry developer, Maria. Uh, yeah, so I like try to imagine that for a moment. You you come into work in the morning at like nine ish. Uh, you've had your favorite caffeinated drink, and uh, you've gone to your desk, and your beloved project manager comes in and gives you that uh, tells you that the assignment for that week is um, to create a, a web application somewhere on the internet that lists beers to its visitors. So uh, you go away, you have a, a quick chat with your teammates, and you decide to deploy it as a simple uh, Ruby web application. Uh, so let's have a look at the first step, which is how do we deploy an app onto Cloud Foundry? So uh, we've checked out the first step here. Uh, you'll see that we just have one endpoint, and that endpoint renders an HTML page, which just statically displays a list of beers to anybody that visits it. And if we wanted, we can go ahead and um, deploy that web application. That's exactly what we're going to do. The only thing that we'll have to change is that the instruction, uh, the startup instruction, we will change the hard-coded 8080 port into an environment variable called port. Now, this environment variable is populated by Cloud Foundry, and it's important to have it, um, to use it like that for two reasons. First of all, it's the port where uh, Cloud Foundry will redirect traffic, uh, so we don't want to lose that. And secondly, it's a port against which it will run any health checks. Um, it exposes it to us through this, yeah, through this variable, so now we're ready to go. We CF push and the name of the application, and this will go away and do stuff. So what's happening in the background? The first thing that happens is that the command line tool that we're targeting to talk to Cloud Foundry, which is called the CFCLI, will create a zip of all of our code and pass that on to Cloud Foundry. Once Cloud Foundry has our code, it needs, first of all, to determine what it's written in. So uh, it comes equipped with a set of diagnostic scripts, if you like, which are called build packs. And their responsibility is to go through the code and see, is it a, a Ruby application? Is it a Java project? What is it? Once it finds that out, it knows how to build it. And that's exactly what it does. It builds it into an executable package, which in CF Lingo is called a droplet. It then takes that droplet and deploys it into a container and attempts to start the application in the way that we have instructed it. In the first seconds after it has attempted to start, it will perform some checks against the port. And if everything is up and running, it will consider the deployment successful. And it will give us back a route through which we can go ahead and access that uh, application. So let's have a look at what our application looks like at this point. <gasps> like nothing. All right, brilliant. OK, so yeah, it's pretty much what we were expecting. Uh, yeah, we have a static table and a little image on the top. Mm -hmm. So what feature are we adding next? Yeah, so All right. what, what I would like to do, like when I deploy applications to the internet, the next step that I do is try to add some tracking on it. So to figure out who is visiting my website and how many visitors I'm get, am I getting per day. So I normally do that with a tool called Google Analytics, in which you can insert some JavaScript on your page, and it will track visitors for you. So like we have done just that in, your, on our, in our sample application. So in our sample, cap, sample application, we have a script tag from Google Analytics injected. Now this script tag needs some configuration. This configuration that it needs is my account ID, essentially, on Google Analytics, and that is injected into this tag. So traditionally, uh, you, would, you would inject this uh, configuration through different means. So the first option is you could just keep it in this inside the code, or you could have a configuration file. Uh, what Cloud Foundry asks you to do is keep uh, all the configuration for your application in environment variables. So, and you can pull the configuration from your environment variable in your application. So the reason for that is your app code is then separate from your configuration code. So you could c deploy the same app artifact onto different environments like a dev and prod. So what we have done over here is uh, we have said like the configuration for the account will come from an environment variable called GA tag. And we can use Cloud Foundry to, to set that environment. 
So the way that you do that is uh, you use a CLI command called c cf set n and give the app name and the environment variable that you want to set. And if you restart the application, what will happen is that environment variable will be injected to Cloud Foundry and it will be replaced inside our our tag there. So if you can go to the source. Yeah, so by magic, uh, we have our our code injected over there. Uh, so what, what's next? So imagine. Uh, so the other way, other thing that you can do is you can see the environment variables set on an application. So the way that you do that is you have a command called cfn and application name that would give you a list of all the user provided environment variables or configuration that you have set up for that application. So this is the way you can access that. You can also see that there are, there are some system provided variables and we'll come to those later. So. So now, what's next? So our project manager is back, and like apparently our amazing application has gone viral on the internet. And how can we possibly cope with so much traffic? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a really good problem to have, I think, struggling for resources. I guess it means you have a lot of visitors. There's generally, as you may or may not know, two ways that you can provide more uh, oomph to your applications. Uh, you can either provide more resources to the servers, more RAM or more disk, which is also known as scaling up. Or you can simply have more instances of that app uh, serving requests, uh, which is also known as scaling out. Um, so we can try and figure out what exactly the problem is by looking at CF apps, uh, or C CF app beer as well. We'll give it for that specific one. So uh, you can see next to, oh, where am I? Oh, over here we have uh, how much CPU utilization we have and how much memory and disk we're using. So if we try and imagine a very high CPU load, for example, that would indicate high traffic. And in such a situation, we would probably think of simply having more instances um, of the application. <coughs> now, Cloud Foundry makes it really easy for us to uh, replicate our code. And we just do that with a command called cfscale. And then with the flag minus i, we can provide the number of instances that we want to run. So if we say that we wanted five in total. And that's pretty much all of the work that we have to do. We don't need to do any discovery or any um, like load balancing or anything like that. Cloud Foundry will do it for us. And then we'll start uh, giving traffic to all of these five instances equally. <laughs> um, to see it in action, if we go back to our page, um, I think we have added a little line at the bottom. If it eventually comes up. Uh, yes, which tell us which uh, server is, which instance is currently serving our request. And if we refresh enough times, we should see it uh, changing incredibly low. Yeah, and that was about it. If we had, the, if we just, if we preferred to give more memory to our applications, for example, we use exactly the same commands: so CF scale just with different flags, minus m for memory, uh, for example. Next step is that we need to drive uh, engagement, and that's a, a very good point because until now we've had this static HTML table, so that's not very interesting. And our project manager wants us to uh, enable users to add their own beer. Yeah, yeah. so uh, as you saw, our application is extremely static, uh, and the, the reason is because uh, we, don't, we don't really receive any data from the, inf uh, from the end user, and we don't save it anywhere, and we don't push it out to the user again. So as we mentioned, in Cloud Foundry, uh, the applications run inside containers. So it won't be a good idea to like write a file in the container that the application is running in f to retrieve the data back. One reason is that container, like that data will only remain with that container and won't be like shared across all the containers. 
and the other reason is like more importantly containers are ephemeral so you're supposed to assume that they can be destroyed and recreated anytime so uh, like so the encapsulation through which you can save data is uh, in cloud foundry is called a data service an example of a data service is like mysql or redis or a blob store so the way that you interact with a data service is you uh, you you get a certain set of credentials through your environment you connect to that database and save data into it so you can look at the services data services available to you on your cloud foundry installation by uh, creating a, uh, firing off a command called cf marketplace so this will give you a list of services that are available uh, like on the cf dev uh, installation you it comes with mysql rabbit and redis and all of them have certain plans. So for, for our application, we can bind it to, say, a MySQL. So we create a service uh, of MySQL and uh, choose a plan. So, yeah, so this has now given us, like, th this is an automated way of creating a, a data store. So we have a usable database instance. So when I like, let's just take a moment to uh, like acknowledge what has happened here. Uh, so when I was uh, working at my last company, it took quite some time to do this process. So what I had to do to create a database was create a ticket and then follow up with the administrator to like, like ask, like fulfill my request. So that is self-served now, and you can do CF uh, like create service if the operator has automated his workflow you can get a database that you could use. So the next thing that we do is essentially like use this database in our application. So the, the, the concept or the lingo for like attaching a database to your application is called bind. So if you bind a service to, it, so we will bind our application to this service. So what this will do essentially is get the credentials for the service and give it or inject it into the application's environment. So if you look at the code changes that we have done, we have some very preliminary uh, database connection. So we're just creating a table and uh, we have some uh, post request handle, which will insert records into the database. The important thing to note here is like on line, line number four, we are connecting to the database using a, <coughs> a environment variable called database URL. So this is injected in by our bind service. So this is specific to Ruby. So the Ruby build pack will construct the database URL from VCAP services, which we will talk about more uh, in a bit. So after we, after we have bound and pushed our applications, you can see that all of our applications have started again, and all of our applications are bound to that database that we created. So if we like man go to our app again and add some more data, Yeah, the DMS lookup is taking time. Probably. Yeah. So now you can see the application uh, can do uh, can connect to the database as well and store data inside a data store. Uh, if you go back to uh, the the environment, we can see that in the application's environment, Cloud Foundry has injected a special variable called VCAP services. So this is common across all like languages that you use on Cloud Foundry. And this essentially contains the credentials to connect to that database. So if you, if you are like debugging something, you can essentially take that URL and use a MySQL client to hop onto the database and see, if some, see what is going wrong. Yeah, uh, and just an additional point that I think is quite interesting is that when you're running with five instances of the same application, they can also immediately see that one database. Cloud Foundry gives you that for free as well, which is quite cool. Um, right, so I think we've got a pretty mature version of our application now. It's time to start thinking about 
a bit of our long term strategy. How do we manage logs for it? How do we what's our strategy if things start going wrong? So uh, a typical approach to do logs in an application would be this one, for example. You have a, a, a log file that you open at the beginning of your code, and then when something noteworthy happens, you might want to log some lines inside uh, at, at those points and say, oh, this happened here, this happened here. Uh, for the reason mainly that Jatin mentioned before, um, which is that containers are fairly ephemeral, so you can't really depend on their permanent storage being available at all times. Um, there's a better approach that Cloud Foundry adopts. Um, and that is that you, all you need to do for Cloud Foundry to, do, to, to, to register your, the logs for you is to just put out any logs that you want in standard out stream. And that's pretty much it. So anything that touches the log file will just go and be replaced with a puts for Ruby. Um, and that does a couple of things for us. So first of all, it mitigates that risk of permanent storage flying away and us losing our, our logs. Um, secondly, which is also quite a cool addition, is if we have multiple instances of the application running, uh, with a traditional approach, we would have to somehow be able to concatenate them into one or somehow coordinate them amongst themselves to find out what's happening where. Cloud Foundry does that log aggregation for us, and it also gives you the capability of forwarding these logs to an external log drain, if you so want to do. Um, Brilliant, so we have the, the new version of the application uh, pushed, and we can run a command called CF logs, and the application name, I think. And this will give us a, uh, a tail link of the logs at real time. We've added lines every time somebody loads the, the screen and every time somebody adds a beer. That's not a beer. Um, <laughs> so if we make a few requests, we're going to see um, in the other screen that logs are going to start streaming in. Uh, which is quite quite a good tool uh, if you'd like to see how your application is performing. Um, I think that's about it. And then the last step that we might want to look at, at the last minute as all panics happen, is what happens when we want to debug something. And for that, let's have a look at the last version of the application, which introduces a, um, a random bug, as bugs usually are. Um, so yes, you'll notice that just on line five we have an exception. Oops, we have an exception that checks for something and explodes if it's not there. Um, so we'll just give that a moment to be deployed. So this is the point where it attempts to start the instances. And we'll see that, sadly, it failed um, badly, actually. <laughs> so it gives us a, a hint of, look at the recent logs. And this is the command. So we can have a look at that. And this will probably give us an indication uh, that, oh, oh, but as we forgot to set that must exist environment variable. Um, so that is fairly straightforward to fix. We can simply cf set to env in that environment variable. And that should um, have them start. Cool. Uh, that will have them start. Imagine, though, that if you had a more kind of obscure bug, that something like a networking issue, that you, you assume that you're able, for example, to ping google.com, google but you're not able to. This is something that you can't necessarily see um, from your logs, as in you, you can't. Um, you can't very much see what the setup of the container is like. So things like uh, interface configuration or the, what the local file system, file system looks like. So for that, Cloud Foundry provides you with quite a uh, quite handy command, which is cfssh, the name of the application, and optionally the uh, ID of the container that you want to SSH into. And it will open a uh, an SSH session on that container. And you can do your troubleshooting there if you so wish to. Brilliant. So with that, I think it's time to go home. That's the end of the day. <laughs> All right, so yeah. uh, to summarize, uh, we looked at, we explained to you what Cloud Foundry is and like the different flavors of Cloud Foundry. 
we took you through the basic Cloud Foundry journey for an application developer, so which is CF push for taking your code and giving it to Cloud Foundry to run, CF environment to set your configuration through environments, CF scale to add more uh, compute cap capacity to your application, CF marketplace to see the available services, CF create service to create uh, new services that you could use your application in your application with the bind, and some debugging tools like logs and SSH. So I think with, with this, we, we hope to have given you enough information to go and try out Cloud Foundry for yourself. You can do download it from PCF Dev. I think that is a really nice start uh, point to start with to download and just to try it out on your local. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any questions or thoughts? Yeah, so the, the applications that we described are called 12-factor applications. So these are essentially stateless applications that you need to push to Cloud Foundry. So if, you, if your application relies on some state being there on local disk, that won't work. We have to encapsulate that state out into a service so that you can, your application remains stateless and then you can scale services uh, separately than the application code. No, so, uh, so the question is, is there any way to scale the services? So th I think that is a really service specific thing. So different services will handle it different uh, differently. So what what is a binding, right? Like so in uh, data stores like Redis, a binding is uh, like they cannot create a separate binding for each app that joins Redis. It will give you the same credentials back. And for example, a data store like MySQL, it might create a new user for every time you bind to a different app. Right, so it is th that that problem is really service specific, and different services do it in a different way. The encapsulation that uh, Cl Cloud Foundry provides to you is just create a service and attach to it, rather than so that operators of that service can scale it independently of your applications in Cloud Foundry. Does that make sense? However, if you have, for example, like we did, five instances, is that what you meant? And you want each one to bind to different yes, service. I see what you mean. So th the binding is between the application and the service. So if you have multiple instances of the application, they're still the same thing, if that makes sense. Yeah. For them to be able to look at different instances, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe they have to be deployed as different yeah. apps, yeah. which you can do. You can simply, uh, we did CF push beer. If we did from the same code directory, CF push beer too, they would be di completely different entities at that point. Um, does that answer your question? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that that workflow really remains outside of Cloud Foundry. And uh, so what you could do in, for example, if you would like more shards on a MongoDB cluster, you could update the service with the shard ID, for example, how many shards you would like. But it's up to the service author to actually like take in your variables and respond to your request. So Cloud Foundry does not have any inherent way of scaling services. That is like, so what it does is publishes a service broker API through which people can implement it and host their services for Cloud Foundry. So, so the, the marketplace that you see is just a way to attach to a service. Cloud Foundry itself does not have any services in, inside of it. The CF, done, CF dev, the PCF dev application that we showed you, comes pre-installed with like those three services. 
but that is specific to PCF dev, not Cloud Foundry in general. Cloud Foundry is a platform for pushing applications and services. It allows you to take service data and attach it to an application. All right, thank you very much. Thanks very much.